Hi everybody, we're here with Melissa Groves and she is a functional medicine dietitian. What does that mean? Well, you're gonna find out. <laughs> She's gonna to talk to us today about our hormones, weight and fertility, and really the connection between all of them. So a healthy lifestyle is something that is easier to maintain when we understand what's going on inside us. When we have kind of that little internal reassurance that, you know, our bodies are doing something, we're not imagining it. So Melissa's going to give us some helpful information today on really why our bodies are different as women and what we should pay attention to. So I'm going to stop talking and let Melissa take it away. Hey. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you and be a part of all these other like-minded ladies yeah. working in women's health. So yay. Um, so yeah, I own a dietetic practice called Avocado Grove Nutrition and Wellness, and I specialize in women's health and hormones. So most of the clients that I see have PCOS or they're struggling with fertility or they're, you know, around the same age we are yeah. and then, you know, 30s, 40s, and all of, sudden, <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, like things that worked for them in the past may not be working. They may be noticing, mm -hmm. um, you know, their bodies aren't quite shaped the same way, even mm -hmm. though they might weigh the same that they did a few years ago. Um, and I really started to dig into women's hormones because I was working in another private practice and I saw all of the weight loss clients they were all given yeah. to me which was just yeah and so <laughs> something that I started to notice when I started to dig into their health histories and get some results of some tests is that they all had some sort of underlying hormone imbalance um, especially the women I mean I'm sure you know like with men you can tell them to switch from regular beer to light beer and they lose like 10 pounds in a week yeah, you know it's of just course. like the way that their hormones work. And it's just yeah. not like that for women. Um, so it's a bit more of a challenge. Um, but I, I like to help women, you know, feel their best and, you know, feel comfortable with their bodies, with the natural hormonal changes that happen as we age and also just month to month cyclically. I mean, mm -hmm. your body is not the same um, when you are ovulating as it is when you have your period or, you know, some of those really great in between days when we're feeling really good, yeah. you know. Absolutely. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, what can I, what do you think I should share? Okay. What do you think our ladies would like to know? So I would love to know what are some of the things you saw in your weight loss clients that already I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, so some common things and the things that I look at first are um, thyroid disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so women, um, it's much more common to have thyroid disorder in women than it is in men. Um, and it often goes undiagnosed. So, you know, even if you get your TSH level tested at your doctor, um, it's not really a good indication of how your thyroid itself is functioning. Really? TSH actually comes from your hypo. I have a cat showing up. Um, <laughs> Mine's TSH, here too. It's okay. Yeah. Um, TSH is made by your hypothalamus mm -hmm. and it signals to your thyroid to make thyroid hormones. So when it's high, it's sort of an indication that your thyroid might not mm -hmm. be functioning at its best, but it's not necessarily um, an indication that your thyroid isn't functioning. So in order to see what your thyroid itself is really doing, you really need to look at T4 and T3 because um, those are your, your thyroid hormones. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that I see in a lot of people, and especially because I deal with PCOS women, yeah. is um, insulin resistance. You know, so so your insulin actually starts to go up about 10 years before your blood glucose does, which is kind of amazing. So when you do a fasting blood glucose um, at your doctor, your yeah. annual physical, um, it can come back within range. But if you don't get an insulin level and figure out what's going on with your insulin, you don't really know the full story of what's going on. So when your insulin is high, um, you know, just basic nutrition, biochemistry mm -hmm. is your body exists in two states. 
it's either a fed state, which is you've just eaten mm -hmm. and are breaking down all those nutrients and absorbing them and your body's shuttling them off for storage or they're getting mm -hmm. used up. And then um, there's the fasting state, which starts to happen about four hours after we eat. And that's where everything happens in reverse. It's where that fat that went out to your cells starts to get burned for energy. It's when your body's using your glucose stores in the form of glycogen. Mm -hmm. So everything's getting used up during that period. Um, so that's why a lot of people are really crazy about this whole intermittent fasting thing because yeah. You know, theoretically, if you spend more time in the fasting state, you mm -hmm. should be tapping into those stores more, right? Right. Um, but it doesn't really work in women that way. <laughs> um, but what I see more often is that chronically elevated insulin. And so when your body is in that, it right. thinks it's in the fed state, even if you haven't eaten recently. So when your body's in the fed state, you can't access all that stored energy that you've got elsewhere oh. in your body. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. So um, oh, keeping man. insulin under control is a, a major factor with weight loss resistance. So what do you do about that? How can you keep your insulin under control? Yeah, you want to eat to balance blood sugar. Um, mm -hmm. I never, ever recommend diets. And this is why, you know, people people get so excited about like the keto diet or <laughs> yeah. super low carb diets, especially for PCOS and yeah. insulin resistance. Um, and you, you can actually mess your hormones up more oh, doing yeah. a diet like that. Yeah, your, um, your adrenal glands, you know, they, mm -hmm. they react to stress and Back in the day when we were cavemen, um, you know, if a woolly mammoth was charging you on a tundra, your adrenals start to spit out cortisol yeah. and give you energy so you have that fight or flight mode right. happening. Um, but your body doesn't perceive any difference between that kind of stress mm -hmm. or the stress of a meeting or the stress of running late mm -hmm. or even the stress of over-exercise, um, yeah. stress, str you know, exercise is stress on your body. It's a good stress most of the time, but mm -hmm. if you're overdoing it, you can be causing your adrenals to be shooting out cortisol and oh. then you're going to you know, cortisol leads to belly fat. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of backfiring. You know, I've seen clients who exercise twice a day and they're gaining weight. That's and so it's unfair. Like, <laughs> it really is. Um, so, so you want to, to eat to, to balance your blood sugar. You want to include some, some carbs. I mean, not like Western American diet yeah. level carbs, but like yeah. not 20 grams of carbs a day either you right. know you want to you want to get you know 20 30 grams of carbs without counting yeah. which you know sorts out to like a normal sized carb portion on yeah. a plate um and you want to include protein with every right. meal and snack because that helps balance your blood sugar right. and then you want to also include fat and fiber because that's going to help you stay satiated longer and the fiber actually slows how quickly the carbs are absorbed in your blood sugar as well that's really great advice and you know with the uh, some well okay a lot of us out there are the type a sort where yeah. we're like, okay, this no diet thing sounds great, but, you know, what do I eat? What do I do? Mm -hmm. How do you help your clients get past that anxiety of just wanting to be told what to do and getting past that idea of dieting instead of just eating right? Yeah, so your body is so smart. Like, it just, it knows what it needs most of the time. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I went on vacation to New Orleans a couple of years ago. And it's like, after three days of just like eating beignets and shrimp creole and crawfish yes. etouffee, like my body was like screaming for salad. Yes. I was like, I was like, oh we need green stuff. And uh huh, been know, there, yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, I that in the past when I was training for marathons, like I would come home from a long run and just like mow down on pretzels and orange juice. And it's like, yeah. well, what's in pretzels and orange juice? It's carbs. Of potassium yeah. and sodium so like I had somehow stumbled upon this perfect combination to <laughs> you know replenish my body after a long run um yeah. so yeah I, I usually guide people to try to stick to a template you know mm -hmm. you want to include that protein mm -hmm. and 
you know, include a veggie, include, um, you know, some, some sort of gentle lasting carb that's going to stick with you. But beyond that, um, you know, um, it's, it's really up to you what you choose to put in there. Um, I do get a lot of clients who have, um, a history of restricted eating Mm -hmm. and just that like diet binge cycle and, you know, do the egg whites and coffee for breakfast and a green salad for lunch and then come home and eat the whole package of cookies or, um, you know, pick so much while they're making dinner for their families that they don't even end up eating the healthy dinner that they had planned for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So with those clients, I I do try to incorporate planned treats. So, you know, while they're still well, they're still thinking, um, it takes a long time to start to shed that idea of good food, bad food. And especially when it's just been ingrained in us as women since birth, um, that certain foods are, you know, special foods, Mm -hmm. like, you know, cookies are rewards for finishing your broccoli, things like that. So, um, I like, you know, to, to guide women to choose what they think they would like and include it as part of their lunch and dinner. Because, you know, when you're eating something that's high sugar, it's much less likely to have an impact on your blood sugar when you have it as part of a meal. Well, that's, I mean, that's certainly good news for everybody. So you can have your dessert, you can have your treats. It just, you need to think about the big picture. Yeah, how it, I always, I care so much more about how a food makes you feel, um, both emotionally and physically, like, how am I going to feel if I Mm -hmm. eat this food an hour from now? Like, for example, I love pancakes, like, there's nothing like, like, Sunday brunch, pancakes. Mm -hmm you know, so great. But I know two hours later, my blood sugar is going to crash. I'm going to want to crawl into bed and just, you know, feel awful. So, um, if I'm out and I decide to order pancakes, I'll order some eggs on the side. And if I'm home and I make pancakes, I throw in things like nut butter and protein powder just to to give them more staying power. Yeah. And these things are simple. It's not, you know, this, there's no magic combination, you know, food combining, there's a little bit of art and science to it, but there's no, like, you're not going to explode if you do it yeah. wrong. And the, the idea of listening to what your body wants and giving it what it wants, like you said, when you came home from marathon training, there was nothing wrong with orange juice and pretzels because mm-hmm. that was what you needed. I mean, I, I find during my period that all I want is salt reliably and you know I've stopped worrying about it realize there must be a reason Mm -hmm. and trusting your body more is hard for us because you're right we're so oh just even I can't break away from the values on food this is a good food this is a bad food and this is a reward and it's it's tough to break free from that thinking how do you recommend that we get away from that thinking of you know this is good. This is bad. I can have this. I can't have that. I think, you know, food serves a greater purpose than simply nutrients. I mean, there's this whole idea of, um, you know, reducing foods to nutrients and, you know, everyone thinks oranges equal vitamin C, milk equals calcium. Like there are tons of other things in those foods Mm -hmm. that our body gets. And when we eat them as food, we have no idea yet even what about that food makes that magical combination work in our body? So that's why, you know, you see all these scientific studies where they extract nutrients and try to give it to, you know, people who are sick and they don't work. It's like, okay, well, when you take fish oil out of the fish, you know, that recent study that was just in the news this week, when you take fish oil out of fish and you give it to people, it does not impact cardiovascular disease it's like okay well maybe there's something else in the fish that's doing it besides the fish oil right I mean it's it's actually it's a different way of looking at things because you're right that fish oil study was I thought was Mm mind-blowing as someone who well I I take krill oil but you know same deal yeah and when it's still this common misconception that if you take vitamin c that you can stave off a cold. And Which is not know, true. <laughs> not true. I'm sorry, it's not true. No. It's good topically on your skin. <laughs> Vitamin yeah. C is great for your skin, but 
it's not it actually it. it actually does reduce the duration and severity um but it doesn't it's not magic you know, yeah yeah no <laughs> But not by much. It's like, you know, eight days without the vitamin C versus, you know, six and a half days. Right. Exactly. You know, uh, like, that's, you bring up such an interesting point of how we're always reducing these foods to, like, essentially magical properties that are in them. Mm-hmm. And this one thing. And even looking at food differently in that way, like with that fish oil study where fish oil, you know, everywhere you go, it's recommended. Your doctor recommends it. You hear Mm -hmm. magazines, TV. And to see that maybe we don't quite understand it, it's disconcerting. Just Mm -hmm. like when people find out we don't actually understand metabolism fully. You know, it's it's disconcerting to those of us who want to know. (laughs) Yeah, I think, you know, I've heard it's the sign of a good scientist who admits that they don't know what they don't know. Yes. And there are so many things that we're still just on the cusp of understanding. I mean, vitamins were only discovered like a hundred years ago. Like it's not that long ago. And, you know, we're in kind of the same place right now with nutrigenomics and how, how our genes affect our food. And there's these companies selling weight loss diets based on your genes. And we're just, we're not there yet with the science. And like, the blood type diet just, Oh, yeah. Don't even get me started on the blood type diet. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I read through that book and I'm an AB positive. So, you know, when I read through all the recommendations and then I get to my type, it's like, well, you could do whatever you want because you're a combination of both types. Like, <laughs> I've been just throwing the book across like, the room. Like, not come on. helpful in any way. No. Yeah. It's always interesting because, you know, we we want to hear a different answer than eat less, move more, eat real food. I mean, that's that information is so beautifully simple, but we don't like it. It's not magical. And it it doesn't, it does not work. Like I'm my, the bane of my existence right now is doctors telling women with PCOS to go on the keto diet. Oh my God. It's like, first of all, stay in your lane, doc. Like I'm not trying to prescribe medications. Um, And it doesn't work. And, you know, like I said, it can actually backfire. It can cause your hormones to get messed up. Um, And, um, you know, we just, there's no evidence that it works. And, you know, they, so many women come to me and say that their doctors actually think that they're lying about what they're eating, uh, which is just so horrible. It's so so terrible. (laughs) And then, you know, I do a full nutrition assessment on someone. And even though I don't ever count calories or track calories when I analyze someone's intake for the first appointment just to sort of see where they're they're at Mm -hmm. many of these women are eating like 1200 to 1400 calories two meals a day and they're over 200 pounds it's like this is not enough to sustain you know a four-year-old child let alone a fully grown adult an active adult too yeah Um, yeah not mm -hmm. like bedridden yeah (laughs) what what do you recommend to women with PCOS since that has become a more common problem? And it's one that's really life altering. What do you recommend to those women? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, you know, what I talked about already, you know, you got to focus on, on balancing, balancing your blood sugar first and foremost. Um, And then there are some natural remedies that work just as well as the medications that are being given. Um, Yeah, metformin is given to most women, which Mm -hmm. it's an off label usage, but it's used for diabetes for blood sugar control. And, um, Mm -hmm. It's really awful because it depletes vitamins, it depletes uh, Mm. vitamin B12, and doctors are not simultaneously putting women on B12. Um, I get people all the time who've been on it three, four years, and their doctor never tested their B12 levels or anything, um, Mm. which is just horrible. Um, But there's studies that inositol works just as well as metformin. Um, you know, in multiple studies, there's yeah. like good, good evidence on inositol and it's like a cheap and easy fix. Um, you know, the other and thing, evidence-based, <laughs> evidence-based. Yeah. and the other thing is doctors are putting women on birth control pills yeah. to, um, you know, control yeah. their cycles or regulate their cycles. Yeah. And that is total BS. I don't know if I'm allowed yeah. to say, you BS. are allowed to say that. 
Um, yeah, so it doesn't. It masks your cycle with artificial hormones. And wow. it's funny because I hear women say like, oh, the only time I ever got a period was when I was on the pill. It's like, well, that's not even a period. It's, yeah, it's a withdrawal bleed from stopping the hormones wow. for that week. Yeah. So um, it's what's really common in the time when women come to me is when, you know, they were probably diagnosed with PCOS mm -hmm. early and put mm -hmm. on the pill around 16, 18, mm -hmm. or they were never diagnosed, but they had irregular periods and they knew they felt better on the pill. Yeah. Um, their acne cleared up. They weren't getting, you know, horrendous cycles. Well, they were, they were, yeah, they were. <laughs> That's all other story, that but too. <laughs> they, they were getting um, a cycle, you know, quote mm -hmm. unquote cycle. Yeah. Um, so they thought it was working. And then when they're, you know, it's thinking about starting to try a fam, you know, try for a family and they go off the pill and they don't get a period for nine, 10 months, a year, then they start to wonder like what's going on. And yeah. um, at that point, a lot of women are diagnosed at that point because then the symptoms come back with a vengeance, right. like, the acne, the cyclical acne that happens, mm. the PMS acne, yep. um, facial hair, they'll start to notice yeah. their facial hair, they're, they'll start to notice they're gaining weight in their bellies. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, and that's usually terrifying for these women. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I just thought it, you know, get pregnant easily yeah. and go off the pill. And, you know, we, we spend our whole lives trying not to get pregnant. So right. until <laughs> suddenly you want to get pregnant, and you realize how actually hard it is. <laughs> really really hard yeah yeah so so yeah I mean I I definitely I just you know I, I never judge anyone for choosing to go on the pill because you know sometimes it's the best option yeah. that you have at the time um what I object to is doctors presenting it as the option to regulate your periods because right. that is just lazy right <laughs> you yes. know use it for what it's called birth control no, yeah, and there are other methods too that may yeah. work better depending on what stage of your life you're in. Definitely. Um, than you know, pumping your body full of artificial hormones. Yeah, we are fortunate to live in a time where there are lots of options, and yeah, you know, hopefully very soon for men too. <laughs> yeah, which would be so cool. <laughs> Let them take on some of the burden. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Now, speaking of fertility. What do we need to know for our nutrition, for balancing our hormones, whatever it may be for, you know, really improving our fertility, especially since, you know, we're talking pretty much a group of women here who are either having babies or thinking about it. What's your advice for people like us? Yeah, so some of the earlier disorders that we talked about can definitely play a role. So mm -hmm. I recommend getting a full thyroid panel right okay. off the bat um, because thyroid dysfunction, um, even, you know, a low subclinical level yeah. of thyroid dysfunction is responsible for a lot of early miscarriage. Really? Um, so definitely if you've yeah. had a miscarriage already, you should have a full thyroid panel done. I never heard make that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's one of the ones that's most responsible. Um, and then PCOS, insulin mm -hmm. resistance, because insulin um, plays a role in your ovaries right. as well. Um, so you want to get those checked out first. Um, you want to make sure you're eating, you and your partner are eating <laughs> um, a diet that is supportive of fertility. Um, you know, antioxidants are one of the yeah. best things you can do for um, sperm and egg health. Really? So, yeah, so load up on those fruits and veggies. Yeah. Like, the more colors a day you can eat, the better, um, which is also why I, I hate how keto is being recommended for people who are, yeah. you know, about to go through um, – IVF or trying yeah. for, to lose weight to, you know, improve their fertility yeah. because keto is very low in nutrients. It, yeah, like, they're not big on the fruits and vegetables. You just cannot get in enough servings of fruits and vegetables yeah. on that level of carbs to support fertility. Yeah. And, you know, um, in the first trimester of pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, what a baby needs to develop is not actually calories or protein yeah. or fat. Um, they need micronutrients nutrients. So yeah. you are actually potentially harming the health of your baby if you're following mm -hmm. a keto diet. 
which while is you're trying to get pregnant. All macronutrients, which that's, we don't hear, micronutrients are the ones where, you know, you used to hear about them, but now it's all about the macros, you know, the fat, the carbs, the protein. And yeah. that, that's important too. <laughs> that's not yeah. that it's not important, but those micronutrients have fallen by the wayside with the ease of just tracking your macros. And yeah. if it fits your macros way of looking at things. And honestly, I think if there's any diet that comes with a caveat that you have to take a supplement mm-hmm. while you're on it, it's not a good diet. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'd agree. <laughs> not a sustainable diet, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, maybe if that works for you for a jump start or, you know, okay, maybe. Um, I'm not a big fan of low carb diets. Mm-hmm. I think. Perhaps if you're going to do it, maybe something like a cross between South Beach and the Mediterranean diet. But, you know, anything that doesn't allow you fruits and vegetables, I'm really, really skeptical of. Yeah, same same thing with paleo. And, yeah. you know, I, I like the idea because, you know, if you do paleo right, you're mm-hmm. focusing on whole foods, including yeah. fruits and vegetables. But, like, there's no reason most people should avoid legumes yeah. and grains. No. Um, most of us do just fine on it, um, you know, unless you have like celiac. Right, disease. and you'd know it if you did. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely would. Yeah. There's no mystery if you have celiac. No, <laughs> no. So speaking of gluten, mm-hmm. I am um, I, a vegetarian, so gluten and I are like BFFs. But yeah. How do you feel about this no gluten movement, this like gluten-free and fear of gluten? Yeah, so it's been demonized for sure. Uh, I, you know, there are studies that show it's inflammatory mm-hmm. in the small intestine to some people, but we don't, we don't really know the extent of that. Um, so I encourage people to, you know, you know your body better than yeah. I do. Um, I actually have been off gluten myself for a year. Really? Um, yeah, unfortunately. Um, so I have really terrible asthma and like oh, seasonal yeah. allergies mm-hmm. that are not really seasonal. They're year round. Yeah. And so Torture. I, you know, it's like I did it as an experiment. It's like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just give this up for like a couple weeks and see what happens. That's what we do. <laughs> and it's like, 90% better, like, That's like, amazing. like undeniably better. So I'm like, crap because like my family is Italian and oh no I have like gluten in my bloodstream um it's delicious yeah um I think part of the problem when people give up gluten is that then they buy all the gluten-free things Mm -hmm. like gluten-free pastas and gluten-free cookies and gluten-free crackers and um you know there there is evidence that people on a gluten-free diet that is you know largely made up of things like that, um, have worse health outcomes compared with people who eat gluten because, you know, they're just not getting the whole grains. Um, they're not getting the fiber. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely, you know, if a gluten-free diet works for you, I encourage people to stick with, you know, foods that naturally don't have gluten, not, um, not the replacements. Yeah, exactly. That being said, there are a couple of, like, I love that um, uh, chickpea pasta. Yeah, I like that too. (laughs) Edamame pasta. Like, there's so many good replacements out there that that still have fiber and protein and, you know, are still going to help you meet your your fiber and nutrient needs. But, you know, the rice stuff, like rice, you know, let's talk about, you know, insulin problems. If you're eating rice as a replacement... Yeah, rice-based pastas are like, they have almost no protein, no fiber. Um, so yeah, just, just paying attention to, you know, how it makes you feel. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the whole gluten-free movement, for those who don't actually need to do it and who are seeking out these replacements, it reminds me of the the old school movement of no fat, fat free. Yeah, and the so, snack wells, yes. the snack well cookies. Yes. <laughs> and what that meant was, well, you might not have fat, but have some sugar. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, you have to be aware of when you're eating these alternative versions that, you know, you need to pay attention to what's in that too. 
Yeah, there are plenty of great things on the market now. You just really have to like read the ingredients and see what's up. Like there's there's a gluten-free cookie that's made out of coconut, like shredded coconut and yeah. maple syrup. And it's like, okay, this actually has fiber. This yeah. is probably better for me than like right. a gluten-filled cookie even. But exactly. I mean, it's still a cookie. You know, we it's have to. It's still a cookie, yeah. These are still just like snack wells from our youth. You know, it's still junk food. It's just a different version yeah. of junk food. I think one, one of the, the major things that's been going on right now in the whole like wellness community yeah. with those fake foods is like the halo top. Oh my gosh. I that mean, stuff tastes like buttholes. I mean, come on. It, it <laughs> come tastes on, guys. really bad and it's full of sugar alcohols, which um, you know, and it encourages you to eat a pint and yeah. you kind of have that idea that it's free because it doesn't have much sugar, but um, a pint actually does have like 25 grams of sugar in it still, right. um, um, in addition to like 25 grams of sugar alcohols that are just going to destroy your digestive yeah. system. And if you have not experienced overdosing on sugar alcohols, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not going to be very much fun to be around. You're going to be hilarious because you're going to be farting like crazy, but you're not going to be yeah. fun to be around and it feels miserable. So, I think <laughs> every time I see someone who's hooked on those like quest bars, I just think, oh my God, you must spend all day in the bathroom. Those, I love <laughs> quest bars, but you they have taste to, good. But they taste great, but like... One a day tops. <laughs> yeah, there's definite maximums. Um, so, you know, if, if you want a treat, like I always encourage people yeah. to eat, eat the real thing. Um, yes. You know, like I saw a woman at the grocery store who had seven pints of Halo Top in her Good cart. Lord. Like, she's going to eat a pint every night this week. Whereas, like, you would never buy seven no. pints of ice cream at once. Like, it's just not You're something. You would do. never leave home. Your stomach would never forgive you if you did that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, anything. I These foods are kind of, you know, it's fun to have these new options. But, you know, it's still junk food. It's yeah. still overeating. We don't want to get in the habit of, I think, which set in place by that fat-free movement of overeating and mm -hmm. thinking, well, it's safe because it's gluten-free or it's low-carb or whatever it may be. You know, there's still sugar. There's still calories. There's, I mean, calories still do matter, even if counting them is not necessarily helpful. They're, they still yeah. matter. Yeah. <laughs> We talk a lot in um, with my clients about the hunger and fullness scale and getting back in touch because, you know, through years and years of dieting and restriction, you just get out of touch with what your body oh is wanting and asking for. So, um, you know, once you are able to work on that and, you know, acknowledge, okay, I'm not even really hungry. I just want a taste of that yeah. chocolate ice cream. It's so much easier to just open the fridge, have a taste and put it back in the right. freezer, like be totally satisfied by that. And that's okay. Cause you know, anytime you've gotten like this really incredible dessert or a pizza, mm -hmm. the best part of it's the first bite. And then mm -hmm. after, it's like diminishing returns after each bite. And you know, if you want to taste that cool, get a spoonful of ice cream, you know, have a little slice of pizza and, and then you restrict yourself otherwise if you don't do that and then you eat the whole pizza or you eat half a tub of ice cream, which mm -hmm. isn't helpful. Right. Right. So you work with people on intuitive eating. Can you give us some tips on how we can eat more intuitively instead of, you know, worrying about diets and worrying about counting? How do we listen to ourselves when we're trying to eat? Yeah, it's a really long process. I do recommend the book Intuitive Eating, yeah. and there's there's a handbook that come workbook that comes mm -hmm. with that um, that you can work through yourself um, and sort of go through the process of dismantling your unhelpful thinking in terms of food, um, and then just start to really listen to your body, um, mm -hmm. what it's asking for. Um, I do, when I am working with someone who has hormone issues, I, I usually recommend that template that, you know, protein, yeah. fat and fiber at every mm -hmm. meal and often a treat with most, yeah. for most people, um, just to sort of get in the habit. Um, and then I have them, um, 
you know, check in about halfway through a meal and see how their where their hunger and fullness scale is. Um, yeah. Check in about three quarters of the way through the meal. You know, take long pauses. Mm-hmm. A lot of like mindful eating exercises yeah. as well that can help towards, you know, getting back in touch with, yeah. you know, that connection to food and your body as opposed mm-hmm. to that disconnected idea of like, okay, this is what's on my plate. This is what I'm given. This is what I'm going to eat, regardless of whether I want it all or not. Now, what is the difference between intuitive eating and mindful eating? Because we hear both of them a lot. Yeah, intuitive eating is actually a philosophy that was developed, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in there's a set of like 10, 10 principles and guidelines. Mm-hmm. Um, mindful eating is simply the idea of becoming more mindful when we eat. You know, it's, yeah. it's almost like um, with meditation, but mm-hmm. um, you're doing, you know, being fully present in the moment, no matter what you're doing um, and how that relates to food. Right. Um, yeah, so some things that, that we work on when we're talking about mindful eating is paying attention to the colors on your mm-hmm. plate, paying attention to the textures, um, you know, going so far as to think about where did your food come from? Yeah. You know, think about the farmers who grew it and the animal who, you know, lived in a yeah. happy field somewhere, hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Um, but it's just, you know, learning to recognize all of the different aspects yeah. of the food, whether, you know, whether it's sweet, whether it's sour or you know you start to taste more when you're not just yeah. like shoving food in your face without paying attention yeah, which we all do sometimes <laughs> we all car. do yeah we, we yeah. all do sometimes yeah Jennifer Lopez said like 15 years ago something that stuck with me she said her mom told her to never eat while moving and I was like that's great advice never eat uh, while moving. that's that's good you know not in traffic not while you're walking somewhere I was like good advice and it always stuck with me it is it's likely like, source it's, it's good in theory but like there's always reality too like yeah. I, heard, I, I heard another wellness professional like basically say how terrible it is to eat in the car um and it's like sometimes if, if I'm going to have a smoothie on my way to okay. work um, that's a much better option yes. than like either going without breakfast entirely or like eating a bar or something. Right, right. At least I'm getting fruits and vegetables and protein. Um, you know, and, and the car is, you know, where it happens sometimes. And for yeah. some of my clients, like I'm a big fan of car snacks. Like, oh, especially, I have emergency snacks in every place. <laughs> yeah, but especially for those women who tend to binge when they come home from work. Yeah. Um, if, if you like over, you know, prepare yourself for the fact that you're going to be hungry when mm-hmm. you leave the office, like have some almonds in your car, have a cheese stick, yeah. have something that's going to tide you over and take that edge off so that you're not yeah. ravenous by the time you get home. Well, some people have a long commute. I, I live in the DC area uh-huh. and you could probably walk home faster than you can drive home anywhere here. Yeah. And you know, that's for a lot of women, that's the reality. Mm-hmm. And even if it's not, you know, we, like you had described earlier how, well, you ate a good breakfast, had egg whites and coffee, then you had a nice salad at lunch. I mean, you are freaking starved by the time you get home. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. nice to have something to take the edge off. That's, mm-hmm. I like, that's something I do too. I like to have snacks everywhere. <laughs> Just in yeah. case. Yeah. <laughs> So in, in theory, I mean, I think it sounds great to, uh, you know, not eat while moving, but sometimes it's unavoidable. I do try to like sit down and take a real break for lunch with my, you know, lunch and then sit down, you know, at night yeah. for dinner. Um, it's hard though. Breakfast and snacks are definitely more on the run. Well, the world is a very different place than when JLo said this in the early 2000s. <laughs> True. True. I, I'm guessing that she might be eating while moving these days, too. But it's, you know, when she said that, I was, it made me picture the people who are like just housing something sitting in traffic, like a burger. One time on the way to work a couple of years ago, my husband and I looked over at this lady who is eating corn on the cob. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. So, you know, yeah. like eating on the go sometimes happens. It's, but you know, remember that you're eating. Be still as mindful as possible while doing that on the go with your yeah, corn you, you cob at eight o'clock in the morning, I guess. 
I lived in New York City for 20 years and you would not believe the things I saw on the subway. I mean, not even like the eating with, you know, the full yeah. meal and everything, but, you know, women putting their makeup on, oh, yeah. men like clipping their toenails, like, <laughs> like, like what you can accomplish on your commute. <laughs> uh, the weirdest thing I have ever seen was not the corn cob. It was last semester I was walking to teach a class and I see weird stuff on a college campus. <laughs> And this girl walks by me with a full head of lettuce that she is just like peeling off and eating while walking. I was, you know, I saw that. I was like, I ain't mad at that, but that's weird. (laughs) Who does that? But at least you're eating lettuce. Yeah, it's a little weird to be so open about that weirdness to just like do it in public. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, there's, there's strange stuff on campus. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for today's talk. And I just, it, it's so interesting to hear like the actual medicine behind what we're doing to have that view into really the medical part of um, nutrition and our hormones and what's going on inside and some of these reasons why our body behaves that way. And I'll tell you what, I am anxious to look into insulin balance and you know, really what the heck I'm doing to myself all day. So that's really neat. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was super fun. And I hope that your viewers find it helpful. Oh, I'm sure everybody did. But thank you very much, Melissa.